you know, the, the town is set up like an organization. Uh, the board is like a, a, a board that runs a corporation, and the mayor is like the chairman of the board. And the stockholders, which are the citizens, they own us all. And they should be telling us what to do, not the other way around. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the GovGab radio podcast. I am your host, Brian Andreco. Thanks for being along on episode one. Excited to have you and really excited to share our interview with Mayor Weinbrick of the town of Cary in North Carolina. But before we jump in, I did want to do a little table setting with everyone just to share the background, the vision of why this exists. You know, there are so many incredible communities around this country that are doing some great things to grow and prosper um, and improve the lives of their citizens. So we want to talk with a lot of different government leaders about their particular communities, you know, some of the challenges they're facing, but also some of the opportunities for, you know, growth and development, you know, along with learning about their past. You know, why did they decide uh, to really dedicate their life to serving their communities? And maybe some things out of that you guys can learn, especially, you know, folks that want to get involved more but don't know how. You may pick up a couple great tips um, from each of these uh, interviews that we have. So excited for you guys to listen in on this episode today. If you want to check out uh, the Town of Cary's website, it's townofcary.org. Um, and again, Mayor Weinbrick, his last name is spelled W-E-I-N-B-R-E-C-H-T. So without further ado, let's jump into our interview today with Mayor Weinbrick. Mayor Weinbrick, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining this morning. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, this is this is great to get you on. Obviously, as a as a resident of Cary, this is special for me to get a chance to talk with you. So uh, excited to kind of chat through your story a little bit, some of the things that are going on. Um, you know, I want to take a step back, really, uh, to start the conversation because I'm always curious because there's a lot of different folks that are listening to this, whether it's you know kind of civic leaders, whether it's just you know citizens, etc. And I'm always curious, how did you get your start in um, in getting involved in the community, when did that idea originate in your head? Like, hey, maybe this is something I'd like to do. Can you take us back to that time? Well, in 1997, I received a postcard from a guy who was running for office. Now, keep in mind, I'm a software engineer, and most software engineers are introverted, and I'm very introverted or was. And so the uh, postcard say, hey, are you displeased with A, B, C, D, E, F? If you checked any of those boxes, you ought to email us. Well, emailing was pretty safe back in 1997, so I sent them an email. And then they called me up and asked me if I would get involved in this, that, and the other. And I said no to all of it because being an introvert, I didn't want to do anything. And so they said, well, okay, well, we're having an organizational party. If you want to hear more about what we're doing and what this candidate is doing, please feel free to show up. And so I went, and I thought it was fascinating, and the candidate got elected, and afterwards I, I said, you know, <laughs> you ought to let people know what's going on, and your campaign means a lot because it's telling uh, information that people don't have, uh, so why don't you start a blog? And he goes, I'm not a software engineer, you are, why don't you start a blog? And so I did. And that was called Citizens for Balanced Growth, and it took off in 1997. And in about a month or two, we had like a thousand people engaged. And um, so we started um, covering all the council meetings since they weren't televised, they weren't on the computer. The only way you found that what happened is if the media showed up, and they usually showed up on big issues. Uh, so there was a lot of things people thought were very interesting. And uh, the so to make a long story short, the candidate that was uh, uh, I helped get elected uh, asked me if I would uh, uh, get on the planning and zoning board. And I said no. And after about a dozen no's, he beat me down and I finally said yes. And then on that board, they were making decisions like 
how much to allow a house or a plot, uh, a private property into the floodplain. And I remember asking the question, why are we putting things in a floodplain? That makes no sense. And, and today we're paying for that actually, <laughs> because we allow people to put things in a floodplain. Anyway, um, after that, this guy decided to run for mayor and he asked me if I'd run for council. And again, I said no at least a couple of dozen times. And he beat me down, and I finally ran on his coattails, and he was elected mayor, and I was elected on council. Uh, served four years. After a couple of years, uh, I felt that um, I was just going along with a lot of what he said and uh, started doing more and more research. I was totally dependent on him in the beginning because I really didn't know what I was doing. And then uh, after a couple of years, I knew a lot of what I was doing, and he... <clears throat> went to war with all of our neighbors on certain issues, made demands of them, so it created a lot of distrust, uh, demanded a lot of counsel, demanded a lot of uh, staff, and and so there was this environment that wasn't nice. And uh, at the end of four years, he ran for re-election, and he finished a distant third. And of course, of course, I was on his coattails originally, and so they threw me out with him, even though I voted against me more than anybody the last two years I was in office. Um, anyway, that was fine. I was done. I was going back into software engineering while I was, where I was comfortable, and I was going to live happily ever after. Um, so the next guy that came in, uh, the first guy, by the way, was all about slowing growth or stopping growth, uh, which he enacted a bunch of ordinances which were later, later overturned in court. And costs carry a lot of money uh, to do that. So the second guy that come in is says, pedal to the metal. We're building any, anything and everything as fast as we can. And we became the fifth fastest growing community in the nation uh, in 2005 or 2006. And I go, you know, this is nuts, this oscillating thing, right, left, slow, fast. I said, none of that's good uh, for this community. And so I was trying to recruit somebody, uh, and I spent probably six months trying to recruit somebody to run for mayor uh, in 2007. And finally, one of my friends and I were having uh, soda, and, and and I said, "You got to run." And he goes, "I don't have the resume. You do. You got to run." Well, I said, "Well, I'll ask my wife." Knowing that my wife said in 2003 when I lost that I would never run again, and I said, "Hey, that's fine." And uh, I asked her. What do you think? She says, well, you got to do this. And uh, I'm like, oh, I was floored. <laughs> so I uh, signed the the uh, entry fee and paid my $50. And at that time, the incumbent mayor already had $100,000 in the bank, had all the endorsements of all the major businesses and everything. And, and I felt like I was just going to be going through the motions that I would get slaughtered. Uh, within about a week or so, I started getting phone calls from people that read in the paper that I was running, and I found out that not only were we growing at a fast pace, when people went to speak to council, uh, they were treated rudely, like, uh, we're in charge and you need to just get over it and do what we say, you know, kind of attitude. And I'm like, well, that's really wrong because, you know, the, the town is set up like an organization. Uh, the board is like a... a a board that runs a corporation, and the mayor is like the chairman of the board. And the stockholders, which are the citizens, they own us all. And they should be telling us what to do, not the other way around. And so I thought that was very wrong. And so those were the the main issues that I ran on. Uh, have some balance in the way we're growing, use some common sense, and uh, make sure that everyone is heard, and especially the citizens. So I committed at that time that I would always answer emails, which I've kept through 11 years. I've done that. If you send me an email, and if you cut and paste a group email, I'm probably not going to answer it. But if you send me an email individually, I will. Um, and then I said I would answer to the citizens once a month in a program, which I started. It's Carry Matters, still runs today. And then I would blog every week like a report to the stockholders exactly what I did. And I've done that every week since 2007, so you can go out and read all that online if you want to go to sleep real fast. Uh, but it, it takes into account everything that I've done. And so that's kind of the 
um, thing I did is running for mayor, what led up to it, now I got to where I was uh, today. Uh, one of the biggest challenges right off the bat was uh, you had council members that were for or against previous mayors, and it was an us versus them, and there were some very unpleasant conversations in the first two or three months. And it took me several months to get people to understand that, hey, you can be politically left, you can be politically right, but most of that has nothing to do with what we're doing in Cary. What we're doing in Cary is providing services uh, at the basic water, sewer, fire, police, and uh, we and parks, and we need to make sure that businesses thrive and prosper. We need to make sure that citizens are heard, and we make need to make sure that they're part of the process. And if you take away all the other state and federal issues like gun control or abortion or whatever, uh, that really doesn't have a lot to do with what we're doing. And if we focus on just what we're doing, then we can get a lot done. And I was amazed that uh, they took me for that. Uh, and so the council started working together, and I thought it was a honeymoon, and here we are 11 years later, and we're still working together. And I'm so proud of the council for actually taking that position. So when we get requests to do a resolution, you know, against this or that, we say, no, we're, that's our practice not to do that. We don't get involved in federal and state issues. With one exception, we got involved in HB2 because that had a direct impact on carry of about $5 million a year in economic benefits. So anyway, that's a, a quick rundown of how, how I got to where I am today. <laughs> no, that's good. What, what was the, you know, I'm curious, you mentioned that kind of period of uncertainty, kind of getting in the position of running for mayor. What were you most nervous about running for mayor that maybe has been confirmed since or maybe has been debunked and you're like, hey, I don't know why I was worried about that? Well, I almost had a feeling of embarrassment, um, thinking that, you know, I'm going to sign up and everybody's going to laugh. You know, you're running against him. He's got all the money, all the power, all the people behind him, and you're running against him. How ridiculous. And that's not true. If you really believe in something in your heart and you know that there's a lot of other people that believe in that, it doesn't matter how much that person has in money or endorsements. I was outspent eight to one or six to one. And I beat him 60 to 40 percent. It was a slaughter. And it had nothing to do with money. It had to do with people believing in your message. And my message, like I said, was one of having the people heard, uh, having a balanced growth and using common sense and, and taking care of the environment and a lot of things that people in Cary want to see. Uh, help businesses thrive and prosper. All those things can be done. You don't have to be one or the other. You can be all of them. And so we, I was very glad to do that. So the debunking, the debunking part, I guess, was uh, thinking that uh, money and power, you don't have a chance to run against money and power, and you do. So I'm kind of curious, because you mentioned you were an introvert, right? And you kind of you probably hid behind the computer and, and maybe didn't get on top of you. What did you do to overcome that? Because obviously, as mayor, you have to be in front of people all the time you know, doing different speeches and those type of things. Were there any practices you did to improve that or? <laughs> I, I laugh because I could speak for 30 seconds would be my task. And I would spend two to three hours practicing. I'm an audio learner. So I had to say it over and over and over and over. And so in the beginning, it was very uh, memorized and it didn't come across very well. And now uh, I'm being told that I'm a good speaker, which is really surprising and shocking. But now I can get, and it, it's happened in the past, staff will say, you know, that we, we provided you some remarks. Here's some other ones at the last minute, and I can look it over and read it and go, okay, we're going to be talking about this. I need to make, you know, A, B, C, D points. Let's go. And, you know, just uh, wing it uh, for the most part. There's very rare that I'll read from a set uh, of remarks. I usually, I ask staff to provide me remarks mainly because I don't want to forget anything. You know, show me what you're thinking and then I'll show you what I'm thinking and then I'll just talk from it. And that's kind of the way I give remarks. So to answer your question, it just came with practice. Um, I used to be terrified uh, to speak in public mainly because um, I was afraid I didn't, 
I wouldn't be able to get the points across or I'd come across like an idiot. And what's interesting, even to this day, after I speak, I go, how did that go? And then I, I talked to my wife mostly. She said, it went fine. I said, well, what did I say? Because I don't remember what I said. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, everybody thinks it's fine now and I don't have any problems, but the first year was a struggle. Um, but now I don't have any anxieties about speaking. I don't spend a lot of time. I, I remember the last long uh, talk I gave was to a Rotary Club in November, and it was like a 30-minute talk. And I provided, I created like I don't know a dozen slides, and so I just have the slide come up, take a look at it, and just talk, and then go to the next slide, look at it, and talk, and you know, just gauge it on that. Usually hit it right on the nail about 30 minutes. And so that's kind of the way I do the state of carry address too. It's the same way. I'll put up uh, about 20 slides and I'll just talk through them and usually can cover everything. And, and to prepare for those types of things, I ask staff questions about all the things that I think people care about and, and then it'll create it. That's what I'll be doing over the holidays, by the way, is writing my state of carry address, which I'll give at the end of January. So. And then that's why you, that's on my mind. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. Is the right time for it. Well, and then how do you go about juggling? Because obviously, you you know, you have a full time job. You're the mayor. How do you go about and family? Obviously, how do you juggle that? How do you prioritize things? I'm curious, especially for those not in the position. What's the time commitment look like? Yeah, that's that's um, and, and everybody makes fun of me, but I, I have to schedule every minute of the day pretty much. Um, I'm lucky to work in a group that is very flexible um, and my group is called globalization so the people I work with they're in Beijing and Tokyo uh, so they're like you know 12 hours difference so I can work at nine o'clock ten o'clock at night and they're it's morning time for them so, uh, that all kind of actually works to my benefit uh, but they have to be very flexible for me to be able to come and go I try to keep core hours here so that you know you know i need to go talk to harold well he's in his office or he's not in his office right now they need to know that um so those are the types of things i try to do to juggle it the hardest part in that was transition transitioning your thought process being a software engineer and writing code is a lot different from being mayor and setting policy <laughs> or answering questions of people that are upset or concerned or have an issue uh, you have to think through those things. And again, on the town staff side, I have great people that will respond. They know that when I ask them to respond, they'll respond very quickly. And so we usually have a turnaround response in less than a few hours, if not a day. You know, And so I can punt sometimes. Sometimes I can answer them. But most of the time, uh, I can deal with both of them and I can transition back and forth seamlessly all day and that again took a lot of practice because in the beginning i go okay back to writing code where was i and I have to get in that mindset again whereas now i can just go back and forth and it doesn't bother me at all are there any like daily habits or routines you follow or you know practices kind of that are important to you to keep you structured i think it's very important to have physical health and mental health and so i exercise a lot uh, I'll wake up in the morning about 5.30, uh, spend about 30 minutes to an hour exercising. Uh, if I can, I'll do it at lunch. Uh, but I get at least an hour and a half of cardio in every day. And uh, and unfortunately, I do that seven days a week. Uh, but that helps me keep strong mentally and physically, and it, it helps keep me balanced, I believe. Uh, those are very important. So uh, to structure my day i try to do the same routines over and over i can i know exactly how long it'll take me to get from one part of carry to the other this time of day and so i have a real tight schedule <laughs> and uh the same sort of thing at work i know how long it takes me to do something and finish that and get to the next thing and, and being able to predict and having a scheduled uh environment to work in really helps me be able to do all I need to do. What's your favorite part of being mayor? Uh, meeting with people and talking with people and hearing uh, their perspective about issues or hearing what their big issues are. Uh, we started a thing about six months ago where the um, 
the public information office sends all the social media stuff. They have search engines down and everything they can find, and they send it every morning, and that's fascinating to read. You think everybody's happy, and they're all upset. Um, we had a – yesterday I read the social media, and uh, a lady who happens to be an anchor on WRAL uh, was complaining that ash was falling on her Christmas um, decorations because of construction next door, and they were burning something, and that shouldn't be allowed. And I'm like, what is that about? And then I read on today how staff responded and corrected the situation. She's all happy. And, you know, that's a lot, really important to understand and hear all those types of things. Uh, uh, I, I really appreciate uh, those types of things. But that's that's really important to know what people are thinking, people are doing. And so hearing people talking to people, knowing what people are thinking are very important. And uh, even if it's me in person or if it's reading social media or if it's me um, answering emails, uh, it all plays an important part. And I think uh, you have to respond to citizens because they are our stockholders. They are our taxpayers. So it's important. Is there, you know, one or two decisions, I guess, in your time as mayor that, that you're extremely proud of, things that you accomplished, maybe that, maybe that were difficult, you didn't think were going to be accomplished? I'm just curious your thoughts there. Well, one uh, that I can really think of is we were in a recession, and so everything is basically shutting down, and our capital budget shrunk. And uh, we had a uh, message from the school system that uh, the Cary Elementary School um, is going to be is is going to be sold or torn down. Would be we be interested, and they wanted. I forgot how many million dollars for it, which is interesting since the uh, we went from a citywide school system in like 1972, a countywide school system. We gave that property to them, and then here they are selling it back to us. And it was in a, a state that it was about to fall down. Um, so staff recommended against it, and uh, they said it would cost all this kind of money, and we're in a recession, and we really can't afford that. And so the council overrode that and said, well, let's – Let's buy it. Let's refurbish it, and we'll make it an art center. And uh, not only do we do that by doing it in the recession, we save like two to three million dollars because construction workers didn't have any work and they jumped all over it at a cheap price. <laughs> and so that when you look at the Cary Art Center, at least when I look at it, I think about that story about how that didn't happen and that might have been torn down. And now it's a beautiful building in a signature part of our town, and it was very fortunate that we made the decision we did. Another thing is across the street where we have the fountain, that whole 13 acre site was bought by the town piece by piece, which is very painful because uh, property owners didn't want to sell and they held us for ransom almost uh, to buy that property. So we paid a lot of money for that property. And people are, some people think that's a bad decision because seven acres of that 13 acres is going to be a park. And we've got two acres of it so far, uh, but I think it's a great decision. And we're now having the library be built over there, the new library and the parking deck, which will have 600 spaces. And there's a development proposal going through the process. If it's approved, would wrap that parking deck and you'd see uh, office and residential and retail and all that mix of use uh, right there in downtown. And uh, that will generate a lot more activity in downtown, which is another thing I'm proud of. I remember being out of council meetings at 8, 9 o'clock at night, and there wasn't a soul in downtown. It'd be like a ghost town. And now I can get out at 11 or 12 at night, and there are people everywhere. Uh, so we've really flipped that around, and we've got a lot of momentum in our downtown, and we're proud of that. Uh, and there's a lot more I could <laughs> talk about, but those are some of the things that come to mind right off the bat. What do a lot of those ideas come from top of the art center and those type of things? Is that from the council? Is that from committees? Do, is that a lot of citizens kind of giving their opinions on stuff? How do you guys work that? Well, most of that is from staff. Um, we have truly the best of the best people. Other municipalities from around the United States come to see how we do things. And we will take trips every other year sponsored by the chamber to go to other municipalities, see how they're doing things, and see if there's anything we can 
gain from them. Um, this coming March, I know we're going to go to right outside of Dallas. There's a community there we're going to go look at. Uh, we've been to Carmel, Indiana, Franklin, Tennessee, uh, Greenville, South Carolina. I'm trying to remember all the places. We've been to a bunch of places. And there, each of those places has a positive view. Like a, we've also been to places that didn't have a lot of positive what not to do. And I'm not going to name those cities because it wouldn't be fair. Uh, but we've been to places and, tra and traveled around and said, okay, this is what happens when you do this. And it's like, wow. And uh, so learning uh, from other people's uh, successes and failures really has helped us in making decisions. And that and the fact that we have a lot of continuity on our council, we have over 80 years of experience on this council, which is averages over 10 years a council member, uh, which is pretty significant. So we've kind of seen it all and done it all and know what's good and what's bad. So when we get like a new person into town that wants to propose something and they're trying to blow smoke, uh, we can see right through that. So, uh, that really helps. And you don't have to name, don't, you don't have to name the, the, the jurisdiction or anything, but what was one of those struggles you saw from someone else? And maybe that'll help others listening in that may be going through something similar. Well, one thing to keep in mind is to have a mix of uses. And another thing to keep in mind, if you have a plan that's a good plan, you have to have the backbone to follow through with that plan. Kerry is reaching a point now, uh, since we've built outward, that it's going to be a lot of redevelopment and infill. And that's the most difficult part because you're changing what's right next door to everybody. And they're not going to like it. More than likely, they're not going to like it unless it's a dilapidated property. They're not going to want to see that change because that's not what they bought into, but that's what the plan calls for. And so you get a lot of resistance and a lot of threats, threats being I'm going to vote you out of office, not physical threats um, and that kind of stuff. And if you really believe in what you're doing and you believe in the plan, then you should follow that plan. Now, Kerry's plan was a called the Kerry Community Plan, was created in a three-year process, and it was really created by the citizens. So what we did is we went out all over town for two years, and we got citizen input, and then we had a, a group of citizens, 30 of them, um, and they took that and boiled it down to decision points, you know, because you'd have some people that said, this part of town should be urban, this part of town should be a park, this part of town should be rural. And uh, so it came down to decision points. And that's all we did uh, as council on that plan. So the plan we have that we go by, uh, which is very uh, significant, by the way, includes every type of thing related to development, whether it's the environment or livability or walkability or you name it, it's in that plan. And uh, staff refers to it on every proposal. Uh, but that plan was created by the citizens. And that is a reminder to me every time I'm thinking about going against the plan. It's like, wait a minute, citizens created this plan. You better have a good reason um, to to go against that plan. And so that's the phrase we have is, what is the compelling reason to change? And that's the question we ask ourselves. And that's a good thing to go by, I think. Well, so if we had a little inward reflection, kind of looking at other cities and what they were doing well and not well, what, what do you think for the town of Cary, what's maybe the biggest strength it has and, and where maybe the biggest weakness right now? So some of the biggest strengths we have, one, I think we have a backbone to do the right thing. Two, we partner uh, with everyone. We, in Our chamber, when I say everyone, I'm talking about our chamber, our businesses, our staff. Uh, if we have disagreements, we take those in private, never do those in public. Uh, but we work together and try to be united in the things that we do, be on the same page, don't have to always agree, but we have to always support each other um, and understand that growth is coming. This area of the country will double in size in the next 20, 25 years. And if you think you're not going to grow, then you're fooling yourself um, because this place is changing. And Kerry just got ranked again as a number five place to live in the United States. Uh, this week by Money Magazine, people are coming. They read that. They're going to go, I'm going there. And so this is a lot of change. The question is, how do you manage that change and how do you manage that growth? You can't uh, accept every dense proposal that comes in, especially if it doesn't follow the plan. You have to have uh, a plan to go by that makes sense. Now, what I'm seeing 
uh, in neighboring municipalities is exactly what I saw in Cary in the 90s. They're struggling with, we want to stop growth and we want to grow at all costs. And there's got to be a balance there. And there's got to be a backbone when people, uh, and when there's upheaval, uh, like, we don't want this. And they're, okay, we'll cave, we'll cave. <laughs> You got to uh, be able to say why you're supporting what you're supporting and stand by it. Um, believe in yourself and believe in the plan. And if you can't, you should be in office. I mean, if you just cave by a, a, a somebody complaining, and I get complaints on a daily basis. Uh, I'm kind of used to it. But you got to know in your heart what's right and what's wrong. And uh, at the same time, you got to listen. And um, so, I mean, by saying you got to have a backbone, I'm not saying if you don't listen. A lot of times what you hear from the citizens are correct, and you got to go with that. But there are some that just don't want anything around them. Uh, why can't you just buy that land and make it a park? <laughs> you hear that a lot. Uh, so those are the types of things you, you have to keep in your head, and that's what I think our neighboring municipalities are struggling with because they've been small towns uh, for their entirety uh, of their existence and now they're changing. They're seeing uh, more development and they're seeing more demands and they've got to figure out how to handle that. And uh, I'm here to help if, if if they want my advice. So I'll, I'll let you take on this next one though. You can take the glass half full mentality or glass half empty, your choice. What do you feel for the town of care the next couple of years? What's the biggest opportunity or maybe the biggest challenge kind of in the way the next several years? Well, um, one of the the biggest challenges is is what I've sort of mentioned is infill. Every one of those infill projects will have a lot of pushback, and that's especially important. You watch uh, when, odd years are election years, so we have an election year coming up, and we're going to have big projects uh, proposed um, next year, and it'll be interesting to watch my colleagues see if they can withstand the the screaming and the yelling. Um, downtown is is one of the biggest challenges right now. Why? Because originally, Cary was one square mile. So now we're 60. But it started in one square mile of downtown. And the, the street is called Boundary Street. That shows you where the original boundary was. And it started growing out. So we're seeing a lot of redevelopment in this downtown area. And the people that have lived here 50, 60 years, like you're ruining the town. Well, that's a perspective, yes, but let me tell you what we're doing, how things are better. You know, and, and if you can't explain that, if you can't defend your decision, then you're making a mistake. But if you can, then you need to express that decision. But I think that's going to be our challenge is the communications with our public of changes that are coming. And I'm not saying we're going to mow down downtown and, and rebuild it. That is not what we're doing at all. We're doing infill projects. We address them one at a time. What's good? What's bad? What fits the plan? What doesn't fit the plan? How does this make our community better? And you've got to be able to communicate that. And that's what I ask staff when they propose something to me. I'll use it here first. And I go, well, how do I defend that? You know, that's for if you can't defend it to me, then how am I going to defend it? And uh, so that's uh, one thing I've got to be able to do. So that's the to me the biggest challenge is the infill projects coming up, the ability to uh, decide what's good and what's bad, and stick with uh, your decision and make sure you communicate that to your stockholders, your citizens, your taxpayers. So to, to kind of wrap up, I'll, I'll give you the floor here. Um, maybe a parting shot, a, a, a final quote, anything you kind of live by, or and it could be for other leaders similar to you. It could be for citizens. It could be for anyone. I'm just curious kind of as a lasting, you know, kind of impression on the uh, interview today, something to end on your thoughts. I think our nation and our state and a little bit of our county is very divided and very partisan. And there's a saying we have in Cary, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, when you're providing water and sewer or putting out a fire or saving your life, uh, it just doesn't matter. And you've got to find a way to work together. I can tell you there are members on my council that are huge Trump supporters, and I'm not. I'll just say that up front. And we can have that disagreement. We can laugh at each other. But when it comes to Kerry, 
we're working on what Kerry does. So we work together every day on making Kerry better. And we really believe that. And we really respect each other. We support each other when each of, the, each of us runs for office. Um, that's how much we believe in each other. And it's good to have disagreement. We're all different. But when the disagreements become personal and when the disagreements tear you apart rather than bring you together, then you're causing harm. And I think that's what we're seeing at the state and national level. And I, I, I tell people at my last state of a carry address last year, I said, can you imagine how good we would be as a state if everybody decided to work together and forget parties? I mean, think about that. It's mind boggling what we could probably do. If you just threw the party symbol out and say, hey, let's just work together and make the state the best it could be, uh, how good it could be. Same thing on the national level. I think it would be amazing, and I think that's what we've done in Cary, and I would love to see that on the state and national level, but I'm not seeing it, <laughs> and, and I hope it changes in my lifetime uh, because uh, I think we'd be better off if it did. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that point, and that's a, that's a good that's a good way to end this. Um, I certainly appreciate you taking some time out, Mayor Weinbrecht. It was an awesome conversation. Glad to uh, hear your thoughts, and uh, look forward to seeing uh, what the town's doing in the in the coming years. Hey everyone, thanks for joining in this episode, and we really appreciate if you head over to iTunes, leave us a quick review, give us a rating. We certainly appreciate any feedback you can share so we can make this podcast better each and every episode. Thanks again for listening in. I hope you guys have a phenomenal day. Take care.